Elizabeth Planning Board meeting. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any corrections or revisions that anyone would like to make? No. I move that the minutes be accepted as written. Second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Um, items of correspondence this evening. Letter from Mr. and Mrs. Hankinson regarding Thomas Sony. DEP, excuse me, DEP site location law changes. Governor's Regional Conferences on Small Businesses and FAME website notice slash letter. Uh, also on the agenda, to, uh, excuse me, on the podium tonight <coughs> is a letter from the town attorney regarding um, Fort Williams Park uh, proposed zoning ordinance changes and a letter from Arthur and Susan Lamb, Suzanne Lamb regarding um, Thomasoni. And with that, on to the first um, item on the agenda, which is, which is a consent agenda item. And I'll let Maureen do a brief introduction. Uh, what you have in the package is a request by the Thomasonians to change the building with the building envelope on their lot. This is in the original Stonegate subdivision. It was approved as a cluster subdivision. Therefore, the dimensional requirements of front, rear, and side setbacks don't apply. Um, they would like to put an addition to the front of their home and change the building envelope in that location so that they have a setback of 35 feet instead of 40 feet. Any questions? <coughs> Any discussion? No, nothing to take it off the uh, table. I would just <clears throat> suggest that from the uh, plans that we have, it's difficult to determine what's the existing house and where the proposed changes is the entire house appears to be cross-hatched, unless this is for the entire house. It's not for the entire house. It's just for a mudroom that was supposed to be added to the left front. The front, okay. right. So will be the only only the portion of the house that exceeds that approach that it approaches on a forty foot setback from the road. <coughs> small piece. This document does end up at the registry, doesn't it? Yes, and I have a recording plat for the board to sign tonight. It's approved. <coughs> My only question had to do with setbacks, and you answered that in the presentation. So. I don't have any other questions. Okay. We deal with these individual yours. As you choose. Okay, I have no further questions on that particular item. Okay, we'll move on to <clears throat> item number two on the consent agenda. Maureen, if you just give us a real brief. Yeah. The uh, In by the Sea came to the, to the planning board a couple of years ago and uh, got a major site plan approved and then came back two years ago and got an addition on the front of their, that was on the footprint of their porch and they basically popped out the wall to fill in the porch. What they're asking to do now is take in the, the little small corner that they didn't pop out on the porch so that it's, it's basically squared off and this is uh, being requested to expand the kitchen a small amount so it's being uh, proposed as an amendment to a previously approved site plan. Any questions or comments? As I recall, when we had this two years ago, I think they indicated that they might come back to us at some point and request this as well. Okay, can I have a, <clears throat> do I hear a motion on both consent Mr. agenda Chair. items? Uh, be it ordered that the consent agenda be approved. Second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> the first item on a new business is the Lawton Public Access Waiver, request by Norman and Susan Lawton for a public access waiver for lot U32-5A located off Columbus Road, section 19-4-2B. We will be having a public hearing during this. Another introduction if you... 
Uh, the board last tr saw this plan in July of this year and tabled it to the next meeting. The applicant has asked to be tabled a couple of times since then, and so they're coming back tonight. They have uh, redrawn the plan to more clearly depict the area that they're going to be altering and to identify the wetland areas. And if you look at the plan, what, what you'll find is that there is an RP1 wetland, which is a very poorly drained soil of less than two acres, but more than one acre, on the western side of the site. They're staying at least 100 feet away from that wetland. There are also poorly drained soils on the site, which would constitute an RP2 wetland, and they're also not doing any work within those RP2 wetland areas. Therefore, they don't appear to need a wetlands alteration permit. Uh, this lot does not have any frontage on a town accepted road, so it still requires a public access waiver before it can get a building permit. And the applicant has designed uh, a driveway off of an existing driveway. They're proposing to also in, uh, uh, increase the width of the existing driveway to better accommodate the ladder truck. And that's what they're coming to the board for this evening. Uh, the board had scheduled a public hearing the last in July, and so that has been advertised for tonight's meeting. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, would the applicant like to come to the podium and give a brief presentation? In response to the town engineer's comments, uh, we uh, made a couple of small revisions on the survey, uh, specifically clarifying the uh, grade where the driveway meets the street and also the dimensions on the turnaround. The earlier survey indicated that they were consistent with what I understand was the en traffic engineering B40 standards. The uh, new survey add some radius and dimensions to that to, to clarify that. And, uh, and again, it makes clear the uh, grade where the driveway meets the street uh, was, the town engineer was correct, was closer to 3.5 percent rather than the 3 percent that we had uh, submitted. Uh, and that clarifies that point as well. I think we just rounded that off to the nearest whole percentage uh, in our materials. The Hopefully the plan will clarify the board's uh, concerns last time in terms of identifying the soils in the wetlands and the uh, corresponding areas of the wetland zone in that vicinity. The, we're here for the public access waiver and uh, of the criteria that are required for the public access uh, waiver, there are three of them that we uh, don't meet or, or would, would request that we get waivers from these standards in the ordinance. And those were on the, the minimum pavement, the maximum grade, and the pavement radius. Uh, the minimum pavement, as shown on the plan, follows the, uh, in large part, the existing driveway that, that leads to the neighboring residence that's owned by the, the mine tells. Uh, we are widening it, particularly as it, up near the street, and also it would be clearing some of the trees along the side. Uh, the plans as submitted, I understand, are um, okay with the fire chief in terms of what it takes to get um, fire access vehicles into the site. Uh, similarly, on the maximum grade, uh, at 3.5 percent, I understand that that also is sufficient for the uh, fire ladder truck to get in there, and that also uh, is something that the chief is, is okay with. And on the pavement radius, uh, we had proposed the pavement radius um, meeting the requirements of the ordinance on, um, on the east side. Um, it, it could be done on both sides. That, that adds up to a pretty wide uh, driveway entrance uh, to this property. Uh, we thought that particularly ingress, the uh, emergency vehicles would be coming from the east side. Uh, and that was the most critical um, and we were hoping to just meet the radius criteria of 19.4.2 uh, on the east side and leave the west side pretty much as it is. The fire chief also submitted a letter last week dealing with the turnaround. 
uh, and essentially requesting that the entire turnaround be paved, uh, we're showing uh, pavement on p part of it that we would double as a driveway to the proposed uh, property. Uh, and then the rest of it, uh, loam over gravel, uh, so it'd be grassed and uh, it could be paved. Um, I guess we just have to leave that up to the discretion of the board. That would, you know, certainly is an expensive proposition to do all that pavement. We are in, a, in an area that, although it's outside the 100 foot setback, it's still you know, sensitive. We'd prefer not to have to pave this all over, but if that's what the board thinks it takes to make it safe, then, then we'll do that. Um, we also submitted with our application what we called an option B. Now, if we can reach an agreement with the neighbors, and I have to say we haven't broached that subject with the neighbors at this point, but if we can, there is an option here that would essentially meet the fire chief's uh, request and, uh, and would also, we think, serve as a better emergency access for the Mintel's property, and that would be using the existing driveway that leads to their, their house as part of the turnaround. And it, it, uh, I guess by good fortune for us, if it does work out, it does meet the B40 standards in terms of what would be required for turnaround. I want to make it clear, I mean, we have no right to, to use their property outside of the 50-foot wide right-of-way for a turnaround, and that's why we're asking for our, I guess, our plan A, if you will, to be approved. And then if we can reach an agreement with them uh, that would allow us to proceed with a plan B, uh, we'd like the board to consider that as well. And as I say, stated in my letter of submission, that we'd have to make that clear before uh, we, we um, applied for building permit on which of those two options uh, we'd be proceeding with. Um, John Swan, the surveyor from Owen Haskell, is here. He's done most of the field work here and, and drawn up these plans so he can address uh, specific questions the board may, may have about the, the details of the plan. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lawton are still in Florida, so they're not able to attend tonight. So, thank you for your consideration. <coughs> thank you. I guess at this point it's uh, appropriate to open the public hearing. So with that, um, any members of the public wish to speak? Would you please identify yourself and give your address? Good evening. My name is Chuck Mintel, and I'm the. Uh, I live at 28 Columbus Road, which is the um, the lot that shares the uh, driveway, the and owns the 50 foot right of way. Um, before I begin, I, I'd like to uh, first of all uh, point out that in the motion before you, um, the motion uses the word substantially meets the requirements and. As Mr. Jewell, the Lawton for Mr. Lawton, just pointed out, uh, three out of the seven standards relative to street construction are not met. So I, I take uh, somewhat exception to the word substantially meets when f over 40% of the requirements are not met. So I would just ask that the planning board consider um, all the evidence they're about to hear tonight and not um, view this as a done deal. Um, which brings me to my first point, that the reason that the public access waiver should not be uh, approved simply is because the standards for the, the street construction are not met. Uh, I don't think we need to review what those standards are. Um, I, I can do that if you want. Um, the bottom line is three of them are not met, and, and no one can dispute that. The, uh, the second reason I think that the uh, public access waiver should not be uh, approved is simply because I don't believe that the planning board has the authority to uh, grant a variance of these uh, street construction standards. And if you will permit me, I would like to uh, examine the ordinance um, briefly. The uh, section 1942B uh, public access states that no building permit shall be issued for the construction of a dwelling on any street unless such a street is an accepted public way or is under a performance bond for completion and acceptance. Then the next sentence says, provided, however, the planning board may waive the above requirement, 
the above requirement refers to uh, the street being an acceptable public way. So the planning board does have the authority to waive um, the requirement that it's a public street. And it goes on to say, and further waive in whole or in part the minimum street frontage requirement. But in no way does it say that it can waive the street construction requirements, which is what the uh, applicant is asking for. It goes on to say that in order to waive either the uh, acceptable public way or the uh, street frontage requirements, it should give consideration to the following things. Um, one of them is the future traffic. One of them is the uh, location with respect to the comprehensive plan. And the, and the, the last item uh, in terms of consideration is the adequacy of the street construction proposed. As I've said, the, the planning board only has the authority to waive the um, uh, public way, you know, the accepted public way or the, the minimum road frontage. Uh, the ordinance goes on to say that the ad adequacy of construction of streets for serving three or more lots um, can be uh, a variance for those standards can be given by the planning board uh, and it refers to uh, the zone or the subdivision ordinance in order to do that. It goes on to say the adequacy of street construction for street serving one or more lots shall be determined by the following minimum standards and goes on to to give seven standards. So by breaking down the public access language uh, in the zoning ordinance, what the planning board has authority to do is waive the uh, acceptable public way as well as to waive the minimum street frontage requirements. But in, it doesn't say that the planning board has the authority to grant a variance for one lot subdivisions. Now the other question is, does this make sense? And the fact of the matter is, is that for three or more lot subdivisions, when you go to the subdivision ordinance, there's plenty of uh, latitude and authority for the planning board to um, grant variances in that situation. But one or two lot, um, uh, one or two lots which don't have to go to the subdivision, it makes sense to have a stricter standard, and therefore not the planning board not having the authority to change these minimum standards uh, seems reasonable not to mention the fact that that's what the the law requires or the zoning ordinance requires so based on those two factors the fact that they don't meet the minimum standards and the planning board really does not have the authority to change those minimum standards for adequacy of street uh, construction. You know, I ask that you uh, not approve the public access waiver. Now, the, one of the questions you have to ask is who does have the, the authority to grant variances? And as state law points out in uh, section 4353 of the main, uh, of title 30A of the main statutes, uh, the zoning board has the authority to do that. So therefore, if the planning board uh, deems that it has the authority to change these minimum standards when one, the zoning ordinance doesn't allow for it, and two, state law doesn't allow for it, um, that's another reason why these, uh, this request for a, a public access waiver should be turned down. Now let's suppose that the board feels that they do have that authority, then let's at least look at what the criteria is for that the zoning board would use to grant uh, a variance, in this case, which in this case is what's being asked for. There are four standards that the zoning that uh, are required in order to have uh, a variance granted. Uh, one, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Two, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Uh, three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. And four, the hardship is not a result of actions taken by the, prior, uh, by the applicant or the prior owner. In this case, item A, the land uh, providing a reasonable return, uh, Mr. Lawton has received more than a reasonable return for his uh, land. He sold his improved lot on Mitchell Road. He sold our lot uh, 
and received a reasonable return for that. And he sold the lot uh, down the street uh, from ours and received a return from that. So in terms of what Mr. Lawton owned, he received a reasonable return. And state law is very clear and very strict that uh, somebody requesting a variance is not required to get maximum return for their property, only reasonable return. And as I mentioned, Mr. Lawton has received reasonable return for his land. In terms of hardship, uh, Mr. Lawton caused his own problems in, in that he, the way he divided the land up, uh, first of all, he first divided the land into two lots, leaving the pond lot in question as part of his existing improved house lot. Uh, only when he decided to, improve, uh, to sell his improved house lot did he then uh, cre illegally create this, um, this lot without any frontage. Um, had he decided to break up his land differently, um, he would have been able to uh, get the three lot parcels out of that and we wouldn't uh, have to ask for access, uh, the public access waiver. So the fact that it created his own problem and the fact that by state law he's already received reasonable return from his, his land, that's another reason to deny uh, the public access waiver. So to this point, we've shown that, one, he doesn't meet the standards. Two, the planning board doesn't have the authority to grant a variance to those standards. Uh, three, only the zoning board can um, grant the variances. And even if the zoning, even if the board try or, or attempts to change those standards, using what the zoning ordinance would do in terms of reasonable return and creating his own hardship, uh, the variance would be, uh, be turned down. Um, that really concludes the sort of the legal end of my arguments. There, there's a few, a couple more points uh, on an equitable basis. First of all, uh, Mr. Lawton has used every trick and loophole in the book, and I don't think it's fair that the, the town become a party uh, to his schemes. This lot was created illegally. Um, it says in the zoning, in the subdivision ordinance, where you, or it says in the, in the part of the ordinance that deals with um, street frontage, um, which the public access waiver section refers to, it says existing or new lots that do not meet the above frontage requirements may apply for a public access waiver under section 1942B. What in essence Mr. Lawton has done is he's created this lot illegally and he's now turning around and asking the board, uh, the planning board, to uh, basically bail him out uh, of his jam. It, it's like he's asking for forgiveness when what he should have done is ask for uh, approval before the fact as contemplated in the subdivision or, uh, ordinance. Um, finally, uh, in their letter to the board, uh, the applicant cited uh, some court cases that give them the right to make these changes on what amounts to our property. Um, I'm not sure that it's clear that he has the right to make those changes. In Davis versus Brock, permission to pave a right of way was denied because it may be an added burden on the underlying land. Uh, in this case, if you lower the grade of the driveway and you make the entrance to, their, uh, to the proposed house basically straight in, um, that the speed and the traffic and the, the speed and the increased usage of that driveway, in my opinion, is the same issue that was uh, evidenced in Davis v. Brock and, and is going to cause us a hardship as we have small children and a dog and we regularly use, obviously use that driveway in order to get to Columbus Road. So in conclusion, we've shown that one, the standards are not met in order to have adequate street construction. We've shown that the planning board does not have the authority to grant a variance in this particular instance where there's only a one lot subdivision or a one lot house. Um, if you went to the zoning board, the zoning board would look at this and say that the hardship was created by Mr. Lawton himself and he's already received a reasonable return, as I mentioned, which is very clear in, in state law. It's unclear whether he even has the right to make these changes uh, to, to our driveway. Uh, the lot was created illegally. 
um, when the subdivision ordinance allows for someone to do this before the fact, not after the fact. Um, and finally, it's, it's, a, and it's intrusion on our privacy as, as the, the traffic and the speed with which somebody can now go straight into an, another house law will present a, a danger and a hardship to my, my family. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm Leslie Newton, uh, 24 Columbus Road. I'd like to uh, compliment Charlie on uh, the very eloquent presentation uh, to uh, the planning board this evening. Uh, I am just uh, concerned about this uh, situation and the primary concern I had related to the non-conforming nature of the access. Uh, but Charlie again uh, put forward, I think, a, a very strong case. And uh, another point that I would like to make is that while uh, there might be some potential for a mitigation of a uh, standard if the lot itself was to be utilized by its owner, in this case it's my understanding that the sole purpose is to gain access to a piece of property that, which is going to be sold to another and thereby uh, he know, is, he's going to shuck himself with the whole thing. And I think that is wrong. And uh, while I don't have any young children myself, the access to uh, the property as it exists is sufficiently uh, difficult that it creates a, a traffic problem, in my opinion, and I so stated in a letter to the planning board earlier on. So that's my point. Uh, Mr. Lawton wants to have the planning board approve uh, this waiver so that he can sell his property to another party. And certainly, if you're going to do that, then you should make this uh, access to the property meet every conforming uh, aspect of the code. Otherwise, you're doing a disservice to the party that will ultimately buy the property. Thank you. Thank you. And Tarbell, and I live at Wedgwood Road, which is adjacent on the, the uh, southern side of the property. Uh, I'm very concerned about the pond because any time the ground is frozen and there's a little bit of rain, all the water, excess water, comes into my yard, and the brook, the effluence, goes underneath the culvert, which often gets plugged up, uh, and then behind more property that goes across uh, Mitchell, Mitchell Road and comes out by Stonegate, I think. But the uh, whole area uh, from that pond to Wedgwood Road is a swamp. And I'm wondering if any building gets done on that property, if the ground absorption is changing the level of the pond, or it, it just won't happen, because I am concerned about that. There's a lot of water in there. So I don't know how far away he has, uh, the building could be and still be on the property. That's my concern. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Mary Lou Nesbitt. I live at 32 Columbus Road. And because Mr. Swan is here, I would be interested in learning more about the wetlands issue. I'm on the west side of this uh, proposed public access uh, road. Know that I have considerable wetness in my backyard and wonder what the impact would be there and what the evaluation process would be, too, if there was building there, how that would be attended to. <coughs> Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Please, if you come up to the podium, please. I meant to uh, point out also that uh, I, when I bought my uh, lot, I live at 24, and that was, that's the first house on the left as you go down the street at Columbus Road. Uh, when I bought, of course, we were on septic tanks. I don't know what the plan is 
in this case, whether the sewer is going to be extended back in there or not, uh, as I understand it, uh, there's no sewer extension at the present time. And my point is that uh, in the spring of the year, when the pond is full, uh, it, it goes up uh, right along the edge of my property, which, uh, you know, on the back side of it, and it also uh, works its way up. Uh, let's see if I can pick it out on the map here. Well, anyway, it, it's, uh, it goes up through the uh, back, uh, towards the back side of the curve in the, in the roadway that goes through a Chuck's property. Uh, it, it's quite high. And the, the point that I'm trying to make is that in the spring of the year, with that water table being so high, the, in, at the time when I had my septic tank, we had percolation uh, of the affluent, even though we had a fairly decent uh, leach field in there, to the point where uh, you, you couldn't flush your toilet in the, in the uh, spring of the year. Now, my, 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 my concern is that uh, whether or not the septic tank, if that's what they use, and, our, and leach bed, will be built if in fact this ever does get that far uh, or if there's no sewer if you're going to have a septic tank how is that going to affect the uh, the pond are we going to see uh, coliform bacteria for instance uh, leaching into the into the pond area uh, coming up on the surface or what have you so you know i think there's a lot of uh, other uh, points here that should be looked at uh, in that respect thank you <coughs> thank you Anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Um, who would like to start from the board with questions for the applicant? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Emery? Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Plan to fix a 100-foot uh, buffer zone uh, setback from the RP1 zone, and that goes as far as the existing uh, driveway, from what I can make out on the plan, uh, because the line seems to coincide with the with the uh, proposed uh, roadway alignment. Where does it proceed from that point? If I might, uh, members of the board, my name is John Swan, as Tom said earlier. Um, the we haven't mapped the wetlands onto the onto the Newton property. What we what we did was map the wetlands to uh, to make sure that we weren't intruding into into the 100 foot buffer strip until we got to the existing paved area. I, I don't have an answer for you, Tom, beyond the existing driveway. Thank you. I guess my point is that it uh, may be possible <laughs> that the existing, if the road, uh, whether it's uh, constructed at 15 foot width or something greater than that may require a permit, a wetland alteration permit. John, I I believe you you did a little bit more than just look at the wetlands on the site. We did we did make sure that all the wetlands off the site for the RP1 area were less than two acres. My understanding is that any area where the 100 foot buffer intersected with the existing driveway, the applicant uh, chose not to alter. The existing driveway in that location. Well, well, that's true. Yes, and we did, and we did. As Maureen said, we did look to to ensure that the the total wetland area was was less than two acres. And and if that if it's a if it's a concern to the board, um, if you if you look at the plan, and this is one of the issues that was brought up by the the engineer, and it's one of the issues that we've gotten approved from the fire chief is that we're proposing a 15 foot width down near Columbus Road, but instead of maintaining that 15 foot width all the way to the narrow spot where, the, um, where we might intrude onto the 100 foot buffer area, we've chosen to taper that width, and that's been approved by the fire chief. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, with respect to option B, I would suggest that the applicant put option B uh, in their back pocket until they've talked to the abutters. Um, it's highly unusual for a planning board to continue to consider two alternatives, let alone get one uh, through in an evening. And it would seem to me that if you're serious about option B, the uh, course of action would be to go to the abutter initially 
uh, get the abutter to agree to it, and then if you have something that's workable between you and the butter, bring that back to the planning board for review. Uh, I think there are additional geometrics that need to be provided even on the new layout plan that show the total length of the roads beyond the, the radii, but that, I think that's a minor issue that can be dealt with. I think um, certainly uh, Chuck Mintel raised a number of issues. Uh, I guess for the record, in, in case uh, you haven't watched a lot of planning board meetings, it's not unusual for the planning board, and I'll look to Maureen to fill in whether or not uh, we're empowered to do so. It's my understanding we certainly are, that we do provide waivers from time to time with respect to the public access standards uh, in compliance with a, comprehen a comprehensive plan out of a grave concern and a great concern that excessive pavement, uh, particularly when only a single lot may be added uh, to what would otherwise be just a driveway, uh, can be excessive and uh, not consistent with the rural character of the town. Um, with respect to meeting the variance criteria, uh, I, I'm not giving that much, I'm, I'm not concerned about that because this is not the zoning board, it's the planning board and those are very, very uh, rigorous criteria. If they go to the zoning board for whatever reason, then I'll le leave it to the zoning board to deal with, with those standards. In all fairness, I, I don't recall what our typical waiver width is. Somehow it seems as though it's 14 feet with uh, a two-foot uh, gravel and loam seed shoulder on each side, which provides a total 18-foot accessible width, and that may be the compromise uh, here. Um, again, I'll ask the, the planner to, uh, uh, when I complete this, I have two questions for the planner. One is the issue with respect to the board's authority to grant the uh, design or, or, or layout waivers uh, for the, the driveway. My second question is, uh, have the, did the mine tells lot receive a public access waiver or does it meet the minimum frontage start, uh, standards? Yes, those are two separate questions. And lastly, with respect to the effects on the septic system, uh, perhaps the applicant can enlighten us as to where they stand uh, uh, with uh, HHE 200 forms. Uh, our submission indicates that the uh, intent to connect with the sewer. Okay. I see uh, there are several test pits here, but those are probably for soils, not for uh, septic design. I believe all the ones shown on this plan okay. are, are for the uh, wetlands determination. Okay, thank you. And with respect to what rights uh, the applicant may or may not have within the right-of-way, I, I think that as this planning board has done in the past with boundary disputes and, and perhaps legal disputes as to what rights one may or may not have within a right-of-way, the uh, applicant has submitted evidence with respect to rights of uh, access and, and uh, constructive utilities as part of the Mintel's uh, purchase uh, showed up in that deed. And I'll, I certainly, uh, although that's a concern, that's an issue beyond this uh, board to be uh, resolved uh, among the abutters. So there were, what, three questions? Okay. Uh, starting with the, the typical waiver width, uh, typically the board and the fire chief have, have been kind of trying to come to a, a meeting of, of numbers and what you have usually, the fire chief wants 18 feet and the planning board wants less than that. So what you've usually been doing is the 14 foot width um, with an 18 foot wide gravel base. Uh, it's not what the fire chief would like to see because he's concerned that if you if you loam and seed the two foot shoulders on either side, it doesn't get paved, it doesn't get plowed in the in the winter, and he ends up with the problem. But that's generally what you've been working with. The fire chief has also, in the past, been willing to uh, reduce the to agree to a width that's even narrower than 14 feet. I think the narrowest he's gone is 12 feet in the presence of wetlands. So he's been willing to narrow it down in that one location where there, there is a wetland constriction and then it widens back out again. Uh, in terms of the, the board's authority for waivers, the board has been waiving public access waiver standards for over six years. Um, so it has been accepted interpretation of the ordinance that the board can waive standards in favor of a reduction. And in fact, um, except in a a subdivision I've never, I can't think of a time when the board has required an individual lot to put in a 22 foot wide driveway. Um, 22 feet wide is actually two feet wider than the current standard for a local road. Uh, third, on the Mintel lot, they did not receive a public access waiver. 
uh, they were a lot that pre-existed the frontage requirements. Uh, so even they have 50 feet in that zone, they would normally need 100 feet, but it was a lot that pre-existed the requirements, so they were able to build without a public access waiver. And finally, on, on the, the septic, the applicant did submit a letter from uh, the public works director stating that they can connect to the sewer. Uh, however, it's possible that even if someone could connect to the sewer, they might choose to hook up to a septic system instead. So if the board has strong feelings about that, you may <coughs> consider that in your motion. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, just a, a couple of other comments. Uh, whether or not the, uh, s the original subdivision was created illegal, illegally or uh, ex exercised extreme creativity with the ordinances, uh, public access waivers have been granted uh, throughout this community under very similar situations, and this board has expressed great concern in the past about its tool, uh, use, its being used as a planning tool rather than a tool to relieve hardships. Uh, that's... Um, unfortunately the way it is, but that's uh, the ideal situation with a public access waiver is to maintain rural, rural character. The, uh, the abuse that it sometimes leads to is, is uh, poorly uh, uh, developed uh, subdivisions. Uh, there is nothing about this particular lot in terms of its proposed access or use that is, I think, more, uh, unless I misunderstand the way these lots are laid out, uh, more uh, severe perhaps than let's say the abutting lot in that uh, one of my great aggravations about this type of development is to have someone purchase a lot uh, let's say perhaps like uh, the Newtons have and uh, lo and behold some 10 20 years later somebody builds a house smack in their backyard uh, because of this public access waiver standard but the mine tells have already done that and I would imagine that the impact on the residents of Columbus Road would be similar to the impact that uh, and, and actually they're farther away from Columbus Road than the lot in question is. So in terms of the uh, history of, of granting public access waivers and the approach that this board is taking, there's nothing that I can see that's specifically unusual about this. If this were a public access waiver for three or four additional lots or how many lots may be granted under a public access waiver, that, that may be extraordinary. But this is for what appears to be one additional and last lot. Um, so there's, there's no precedent that I can think of this board not granting uh, public access waivers under uh, similar situations, assuming that the uh, uh, ordinances, the intent of the ordinance and the, and the requirements of the fire chief are, are met, uh, I guess, in coordination with the, with the uh, planning board's concerns about uh, not over, overly paving or other uh, impacts on natural resources. And again, there's a 100-foot setback delineated on the plan and, and uh, assuming when the building permit, if a building permit is applied for, that will be met as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments from the board? Questions? Mr. Wilcox? Uh, I, I have a question just to discuss amongst the board because I, if I remember correctly, there's a lot further down Columbus Road, which when the fire chief gave us his tour of difficult areas to maneuver in, we went a little further down Columbus Road and we turned left uh, and looked at a house which the fire chief explained to us he had no maneuvering room once he got in there. Uh, and it went down a similar sort of 50 foot wide gap in between, in between two houses. And I was wondering if that lot, it, it, when we were there, it looked like there was sort of a small dirt road which continued in the direction of this lot, and I was wondering if you know the neighborhood well enough that that is, in fact, this existing paved drive we're seeing on on this application. If if you can picture Columbus Road mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, relatively small lots lining both sides of it, what has happened is there's there's a long uh, strip of land that runs behind uh, those existing homes on the left side of Columbus Road, and over time. <coughs> They've been divided up into large lots, and there's been little 50-foot access ways. The one you're talking about is the end of Columbus Road. Oh, yeah. But if, if you went east of this lot, just kept moving back, you'd hit the Mintel's lot, and I think that's the last of four lots in the row. Um, I think that... Uh, it's especially important then that the, uh, the sort of turnaround ability, if you will, is something where 
loaming the entire turnaround. It would, would be not consistent with the objectives of the of the intent of the public access waiver. I don't think uh, I, for one board member, would require that it all has to be asphalt and paved. Uh, but on the other hand, I would think it needs to be drivable. We, we've seen, we saw some on that same tour where they were just sort of graveled ways that kind of blended in with the wood, woody nature of the sites and were not, you know, were just travelable by the vehicles. I don't know how other people would feel about that. <clears throat> Questions, comments from anyone else? Any other questions for the applicant or? <clears throat> Does someone have a motion they'd like to put forth? Uh, yeah, I'll propose a motion. Uh, findings of fact, Norman and Susan Lawton are requesting a public access waiver for lot U32-5A located off Columbus Road. Two, the applicant delineated wetland areas which will not be altered during site development. Three, construction of a turnaround is needed to allow emergency vehicles such as a ladder truck to reverse direction. And four, the application substantially complies with the public access waiver standard section 19-4-2B. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Norman and Susan Lawton for a public access waiver for lot U325A located off Columbus Road be granted subject to the following conditions. One, that the turnaround area be paved in accordance with the fire chief's memorandum dated October 8, 1996 to provide adequate turning area for the town ladder truck. Uh, in the alternate Uh, um, period. I want to I strike any reference to option B as part of that. And I would like to add a, a second condition. And the second condition that the uh, access road uh, be uh, not less than 14 feet wide with a two foot uh, gravel shoulder. Uh, typical to uh, previous approved uh, public access waivers uh, by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. <clears throat> Do I hear a second? Second. Any further discussion? Mr. Emery? Uh, yes, I'll add a uh, uh, condition three that the geometrics of the access road and turnaround area be uh, uh, provided uh, as required by the town engineer and include, in addition to the turning radius, distances and lengths uh, beyond all the radii that are shown on the plan. <clears throat> uh, one, for I guess, further comment. How does everyone feel about... Um the slot having to be on sewer, as was stated by the applicant that is planning to be, but we all know what planning to be and what are can be some sometimes be different. Mr. Emery? I think all of the evidence that we've heard uh, indicates that the only appropriate thing to do here is to have it on town sewer. It appears to be a lower uh, than the adjacent lot, certainly. Uh, and I think a lot of people in Cape Elizabeth have inherited uh, almost unbuildable conditions. Uh, and uh, in this uh, time and, and day, I don't see why we should have a, uh, a lot that, uh, which has immediate access to public sewer, not beyond public sewer, which is, again, consistent with, I think, the sewer policy of providing sewer to infill development in Northern Cape. Do you want to make that a condition of your? Certainly, I'd love to make that condition for. <clears throat> Ms. McKay, is, is the, those additional uh, conditions? Certainly quite acceptable, and I just had one more comment, and that is the second paragraph of the Fire Chief's October the 8th letter talks about the, um, 
the note regarding the existing CMP poll. And it seems to me that we ought to at least remove or at least alter the note to indicate that access might be provided. Um. Be moved to. Is that what you're yes, suggesting? I'd, I'd suggest uh, adding another line to the note that's saying to be to be relocated as CMP as per CMP requirements uh, to allow access to the existing paved drive. If I, if I might, Mr. Chairman, um, my interpretation of the our discussion on site with the fire chief was that um, the fire chief was using our note on the plan which said existing pole to be relocated as a reference point for the drawing to indicate where he felt there were two or three trees that needed to be removed. Um, it, it wasn't with regard to the actual pole itself that is being relocated, but the, uh, the existing reference on our plan was just to show the planning board where there were some additional trees mm -hmm. that aren't on our client's land, but that he would like to see removed. Could I have one question? Um, the, where we get into the near the hundred foot buffer on the wetlands, I wonder if we, the board would consider allowing the pavement to be um, less in that vicinity. I, I really, uh, I think that's uh, between the applicant and the fire chief and the, uh, I mean, if you caught uh, between a rock and a hard place here, I, I, I think I feel quite strongly that we have to uh, refer back to a precedent and other applications and, and we're adding a second uh, lot here. Uh, I certainly, I don't necessarily agree with the fire chief with respect to the uh, loam and gravel and seed area, whether that should be all paved since it's essentially uh, adjacent to the 100 foot uh, setback. Uh, but if that's necessary to get approval, I can understand it. Staking that out and requiring it to be plowed certainly is something that could be checked from time to time for compliance. Uh, I, I think that's a matter for the board to discuss. The concern there is that if we, uh, you know, it becomes arbitrary as to where that uh, hardship lies. Uh, you know, do we end up with a, a pavement that uh, narrows down to 10 feet or 11 feet uh, and, and for whatever reason, reason gets extended over half the length of the driveway? Uh, I, it's, I think it's quite unusual for the board to hear as much concern from a butters for a public access waiver as we've heard this evening. And I think as a compromise, uh, if the board uh, simply refers back to its, uh, what it's granted in the past as waivers and in its essence uh, set for a procedure in terms of, uh, I mean, as a precedent for procedure in dealing with this matter, I think that's what we have to rely upon. That's my attitude. I'll let the other board members uh, express theirs. Do we have any other opinions from the board? Mr. Wilcox? Well, <coughs> one of the things I've noticed uh, that uh, quite often we see the turnaround come through in a sort of traditional hammerhead type form where it's a large, large open rectangular area of paving or compacted gravel. And I think that this sort of Y-shaped turnaround uh, presents a, a sort of a, the same usability for turning emergency vehicles around without sort of having the same sort of wide open yeah. expanses uh, and as far as uh, the surface of the turnaround I think that uh, uh, I would uh, I would feel comfortable with uh, basically the the fire chief has uh, what he has accepted in the past which I believe I, I, we, we've seen yeah. ones that are gravel and compacted gravel that support the fire trucks and support the things that stick out from the side to whatever to brace it uh, would it, be satisfactory to me. would it be an unusual request uh, if, if that does, uh, is not paved, that it uh, be placed on the uh, plat and the approval that that area be uh, maintained, be cl kept clear of snow, so that anyone uh, purchasing this lot would see immediately that that uh, uh, requirement uh, applies to, to the area that's shaded as, as uh, gravel? Yeah. Maureen? Uh, 
we discussed that out, out at the site, and it was the fire chief's experience that even if it's a note on the plan, it, it just doesn't get maintained. <coughs> If I may, my, my specific concern uh, was not so much with the turnaround itself, but I think Mr. Emery's uh, suggestion of, of having a minimum of 14 feet pavement on the entire length of the driveway. And at least in, in this area here, that would put some pavement or new pavement uh, within the 100 foot buffer zone. And that's what, what my concern was. Hmm? Is that something that can be permitted with a uh, wetland alteration permit? Mr. Chair, <coughs> one, one of the things that I think uh, might uh, pertain to this is that we're dealing with a situation with an existing paved drive now, which is, uh, I think, contributing somewhat to the uh, impression that we require paving as we match up to things. In, in fact, uh, when we've done this many times before, the ordinance only requires the first 50 feet of a public access way to be paved, and the rest can be gravel or stone dust or whatever. Uh, so I think we, what we're getting into is sort of a mix and match of existing materials and whether or not they get continued over into final in place new materials, which I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, flexibility in how those are, those are approached. For the chair, I, I do want to clarify one statement I made earlier. Um, the fire chief's concern was if you put the gravel base there and then you loam and seed over it, that it won't, even if you put a note on the plan, it will not be kept clear of snow in the winter. Um, that may not be the case if it's a gravel base without the loam and seed on top. Right. <laughs> Anyone else have any feelings about this? I, for one, I think would rather um, have it taper for part of it than widen out again than have to disturb the wetlands. Um, but if the fire chief has a real problem with that, then I'll sort of accede to his wishes. Mr. Chair, we're talking about two separate issues here, and it, it seems as though the question about the turnaround itself, uh, I guess I don't have a strong sense of having it be paved if it's going to be a gravel base without loam and seed, and that's acceptable to the fire chief, but I'm not sure we've really heard from the fire chief on this. The fire chief has said with respect to the turnaround, that he would prefer it to be paved, period. So I don't know if the, if the compromise about gravel base without uh, loaming and seeding would be acceptable to him. With respect to the length of the driveway itself, I'm having a little trouble finding out exactly where the driveway is of the existing paved drive from the plan. There's a, an overhead that goes straight down the existing paved drive, but then there are dotted lines on either side and then also um, continuous lines on either side. And do I understand correctly that the dotted lines or the long dotted lines are the ones that mark the existing pavement yes, right now? Um, if the fire chief has said that the tapered drive is acceptable to him and that is even less pavement than what we have accepted in the past, I don't have a strong sense of requiring precisely what we have done before. It seems to me if this is acceptable to the fire chief that it's, it's acceptable to me. Any other thoughts on either point? I guess I'd ask for a point of clarification uh, with respect to the public access. It's, it's my understanding the public access waiver, I mean public access uh, road requires that there's a 50 foot length of road that's paved uh, where it meets a public street and that that minimum width is 22 feet and has a maximum uh, slope of 2%. 
uh, for that 50 foot dis distance. Right. What what standard uh, beyond that 50 feet uh, typically applies other than the fire chief's uh, requirements to get emergency vehicles and or the planning board's typical uh, <laughs> using of, of uh, 14 feet with two foot wide sh uh, shoulders? The, the 22 foot wide width, and I, I guess I prefer to call it traveled way as opposed to paved way because the board has routinely accepted gravel instead of pavement after the first 50 mm -hmm. feet. There's nothing in the ordinance that says you can't accept gravel. Um, the 22 feet is supposed to go the entire length of the driveway, and that's what the board has routinely waived. And, and you've got a fairly consistent history in the past of, of waiving it to a uh, 14-foot wide travel way with up to two-foot shoulders that also have a gravel base under them on either side. You have narrowed it, and the fire chief has agreed to narrow it. I think the, the narrowest width I've seen is 12 feet um, across a wetland area where it then widens back out again to 14 or 16, whatever the agreed, agreed width has been. As opposed to grade, there has, there's no restriction on the, the grade after the first 50 feet except that it has to function for the public safety vehicles. And in terms of the 2% the grade, the board has waived that up to 5% in the past. Okay. And it's my understanding that if we uh, don't uh, grant a waiver from 22 feet down to what appears to be about 11 feet, that the applicant is dead in the water because they can't get a permit uh, to fill in the RP1 uh, uh, buffer. A portion of the RP1 buffer encroaches on the 50-foot right-of-way. It would be a new road because there's no existing road there. No new roads or new driveways are allowed in an RP1 buffer under the town's wetlands regulations. So they have to move in the opposite direction. If you measure from the point where the 100-foot buffer begins westward across the 50-foot right-of-way, um, you run out of right-of-way width before you get to 14 feet. So the applicant would have to look at purchasing a right-of-way from the abutting property owner if they were required to meet the 14-foot width. And it's and, and realistically, they may be encroaching uh, anyway. If there's fill, which there typically is in wet soils required for the road uh, construction, then if the width is 11 feet, then if there's a foot of fill, then the uh, fill is going to extend into the uh, wetland buffer probably three feet with a three to one side slope, which is typical for road construction. So I think you're into an issue there one way or the other, whether the board makes it 14 feet or uh, it's certainly the way it looks now. If, if we assume that you have about a foot of fill there, given the road depth standards that the town typically has, you may have a road, actually a road surface that could be as narrow as eight feet. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, <coughs> just uh, two points of clarification. One is that the, um, the, the fire chief, we have met on site with the fire chief, and he has reviewed this drawing. And my understanding in, in reading his letter was, and in, in the discussion that we had on site, the only problem that the fire chief had with what we're proposing is that he wanted the entire turnaround paved. Uh, I think we're prepared to do that if that's, a, if that's an issue with the board. The, the fire chief, to my knowledge, had no problem with either the grade or the width design of what we're proposing. The second issue is that on our plan, you'll see a, uh, a, a note that um, a dimension of 11 feet. What we're, what we're telling the planning board in that instance is that we have 11 feet of paved width, either existing or that we can do without being in the buffer strip. The actual paved driveway in that instance would be wider than that. But because there's existing pavement on the adjacent property owner's land, we're not allowed to use that, but for fire and public safety purposes, the, the existing driveway when we get done will be 12 or 13. I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure whether we can get 14 feet or not, but it will be wider than the 11 or 12, which we show. It's just that we don't have a deeded access to that one or two or three feet of, of existing pavement on the west side. Any other questions or comments? 
How do you feel about your motion at this point in time? Is there anything you'd like to revise or want to restate? Uh, I think the issue is here that uh, although the fire chief has not required additional uh, width in the driveway, uh, the planning board is faced with the uh, enviable situation of having to assess whether or not the abutters' concerns uh, and typical planning board procedure on, on such an application uh, is outweighed by uh, the issues dealing with the 100-foot uh, RP1 setback. My sense is that the additional pavement uh, for the turnaround uh, creates as much of an impact as one or two feet of fill within a 100-foot buffer may, but that's not the issue. The issue is that if you're in the buffer, you require a permit. You can't get a permit, so you can't build the road. Um, my sense is if we change it to something else, we're granting uh, something that we haven't done before. I mean, Maureen has stated that we've been as narrow as 12 feet. And there's nothing that uh, says that the mine tells can't put a gate right across that 50-foot right-of-way line and uh, narrow that up to eight feet, uh, assuming there's a one-foot fill situation there. So I, I, I think what I'll do is uh, I'll stick with my motion as I've as I've made it. And okay, that motion has been seconded. I guess it's appropriate to vote on that at this point in time. All those in favor of the motion as proposed, please raise your right hand. All those in, not in favor? It's four to, uh, four to one. Five to, Five to one. Five to one, excuse me. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, perhaps uh, before the applicant leaves the room and the abutters leave the room, let's, let's have it very clear as what the board has just approved. The board has approved a motion which states that the road uh, shall be a minimum of 14 feet wide with two foot shoulders on each side. First item under other business is Fort Williams Zoning Ordinance and Master Plan Amendment, requested by the Town Council for recommendation on the proposed amendments to the Fort Williams Park District and addendum to the Fort Williams Master Plan, section 19-4-9 and section 19-2-7. Marine, would you like to give a brief synopsis? Uh, Mr. Chairman, before you do that, uh, as I have in the past, I'll recuse myself on this matter. No, I'll stick around. Um, before you are, are two, two combined related items. One is a set of amendments to the zoning ordinance. The other is a recommended change to the Fort Williams master plan. Uh, the first piece, it's, it's drafted to fit into the proposed ordinance for, uh, for an, uh, in, in an effort to apply some structure to this review. Uh, the board is using the standard review procedure that you use to review an amendment to the ordinance, even though this is an amendment to the proposed ordinance as opposed to the existing ordinance. Under that procedure, uh, you are required to hold a public hearing before you make a recommendation to the council on what you want to adopt as part of the proposed uh, part of the zoning amendment. The uh, the recommendations you're making in terms of the master plan is advisory to the council. You can or cannot hold a public hearing, although there's no reason not to do both of them at the same time. Uh, what you have before you are uh, four definitions to be added to the definition section. Those have been revised based on the, the uh, workshop the planning board had a couple of weeks ago. and. There were no substantial recommendations. It was basically typographical type issues. Then there's a, um, an addition of a paragraph to this, the purpose statement in the Fort Williams District. 
have a list of uses for the southern section of Fort Williams and then a subset of listed uses for the green that's in the southern section of Fort Williams and the park maintenance area which is in the southern section of Fort Williams and finally a, a recommendation that this that the map that the board has previously seen is not into your package tonight also be adopted but that that map should be amended to to label uh, those things that are referenced in the definitions, including the park maintenance building, heavy equipment building, building number 326, and Humphrey Road. Uh, finally, for this evening, you have on the podium a letter from the town attorney. And again, as part of the planning board's procedure, you usually have the town attorney review an amendment before you hold a public hearing. He, he, we usually try to also have him do that before the council considers adoption. Um, he is making a few recommendations which the board can either try to incorporate into the text this evening or you could endorse his recommendations and then send the package to the council and let them go through actually incorporating his comments into the text. Are there any questions? First off, how does uh, any members of the board been able to have a chance to read the letter from the town attorney and digest it? I have not. I've read it briefly, and it seems to make a lot of sense to me. I was just in the process of trying to interline the um, documents that we have before us with the comments of the town attorney. Uh, would you like to take a couple minutes and try to read this letter? Um, since we seem to be some, on a somewhat of a timetable to get this uh, off our desk and onto the council. If um, the viewing public won't mind, we're going to be, probably be quiet for two or three minutes, so the sound has not got, gone out of the television.
Everybody else have? Wilcox, you all? Yes. Uh, yeah. um, how would the board like to proceed? We take, we have two documents really to deal with here. Um, the proposed changes to the proposed zoning ordinance and the, the next generation after that, which is more changes to the proposal to the proposed. Um, do you want to do the first? Um, zoning and master plan amendments first and then try to incorporate the changes from the town attorney or do you want to just um, as was possibly suggested uh, forward the town attorney's uh, comments along with our package as something that the, the council would, can then put together so how would you like to proceed I'd like to proceed in the first way just because I'd like to be as clear as possible about what we're giving to the council. But before we do that, I think we should have a public hearing and hear what the um, members of the public have to say and then proceed thereafter. Thank you for reminding me. <clears throat> um, opening the public hearing for members of the public to speak. Please come to the podium to state your name and address, please. I have a question. Are, are you asking about questions? Uh, if you'd like to speak, would you come to the podium and state your name and, ad and address? Excuse me? If you would like to speak, would you come to the podium and state your name and address and ask your question? This is a question to the town planner. Are there drafts back in the back of what we're looking at? No. Are there what? seeing a traffic paragraph. I'm not sure what section you're talking about because I don't think there's anything in here that specifically talks about it. Right sure. I'm not sure there's anything in here that specifically talks about traffic. 
I don't think there's anything in here that talks about traffic. You know where Shore Road is, 971 Shore Road, and there's a caution line, and there's also a walk to cross. And when people come around that corner there, I've tried to go across the crosswalk. There's been one policeman stop for me and another person. I don't even use the crosswalk. I go up the street by the first port gate to go in. The caution light, I don't know what it's there for. People don't pay a bit of attention to it. Are, are you don't even let you cross the crosswalk. You have to cross up above because the paths come too fast, so you have to cross up the other way to get across the street. Are you concerned about the sidewalk that may be proposed for Shore Road? There is a sidewalk there. Is, is that what your concern is? What the planning board is talking about right now are changes to uses in Fort Williams. Changing uses in Fort Williams Park. There's nothing in what is being discussed tonight that talks about traffic on Shore Road. The, the council will be discussing that tomorrow night. That's right. But when they have a new ball field, it makes more traffic. And, and when, the, when the planning board does a site plan review of the ball field, they will be allowed to talk about traffic generated by the ball field. No, whenever the site plan is done by the planning board, which probably won't be for a couple of months, the only thing I'm aware of about traffic is on Shore Road for the council tomorrow night. Oh, absolutely it is. What time is it? Seven thirty. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak? <clears throat> Hi, my name is uh, <coughs> Richard Berman. I live at uh, I live on Shore Road. It's a long night. I can't remember the number. Um, I was also on the working group uh, that drafted the original language that uh, you've, uh, making your recommendations, you've reformatted it. And uh, among the working group were two members of the planning board, two members of the town council, two members of uh, the Friends of the Fort, and also two members of the uh, Fort Williams Advisory Committee. I want to recommend, uh, commend you on the work that you're doing here. Um, all the changes and the reformatting, I think, have kept intact the intent uh, that the working committee, as I understood it, came out with. So um, I think, uh, you know, I strongly endorse uh, this, uh, the changes that you're proposing here to the uh, ordinance, to the master plan, to the policy. Um, also, uh, the letter from the attorney makes a, a whole lot of sense to me. I also might remind you that the Fort Williams Advisory uh, committee is also going to be sending their recommendations to the council so that I don't know if I'd spend a lot of tr time tonight trying to incorporate the attorney's recommendation but as I said I think Maureen made the suggestion of sending it with the attorney's letter because they're going to have some other input too I think from the Ford Advisory uh, Board but I just want to uh, encourage you to uh, adopt this to send it on with your recommendations and I think you've done a great job in preserving and uh, in making some rash uh, rationale decisions on Fort Williams. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> anyone, else, anyone else wish to speak? I'm uh, Carol Fritz of Hunt Club Road. Um, I'm representing the Friends of Fort Williams, uh, the group that concerned about the use of the southern area of, the, of Fort Williams and have proposed this permanent preservation of the, the southern section, which um, I also served with two of you on the um, working group working out this wording, um, the consensus language. And I'm generally happy with the language that is suggested in this plan. And I have also looked at the legal opinion, and I think that his uh, suggested wording makes it clear. Um, he did 
uh, just to mention a few specific things, um, he did mention the confusion over having an informal and passive recreation definition as is in here as opposed to another definition that's different in the zoning ordinances for passive recreation. Since we're the group that proposed this language, I guess I'd like to suggest a simplification that this might be just the um, definition referring to Fort Williams be just informal recreation um, and that another definition that we already have as passive recreation stay that way. I think we were trying to um, define what is actually going on in Fort Williams now. I mean there's kite flying and there's sledding and and it is active it's not just uh, passive recreation so uh, we were trying to reflect that but I think that if it, it would be fairly simple if this was informal recreation and we left the definition um, as passive recreation for other areas of the town. Um, he also did make a comment about being more specific in the definition of the multipurpose playing field by saying that it be low it, in on the first page that it be located in Fort Williams Park District. And I just noticed that on the second page, under B2, small b, I think that that ought to read a multipurpose field as approved September 9th, 1996. I think that would be more specific and it would refer to the council decision and be consistent as it would be throughout. Um, I, I think that's basically um, the two suggestions that I have. I, I do commend the work that you've done because I, I do think that the meaning that we were proposing from the working group is, is carried through in this language with the attorney's suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the board, excuse me, the public wish to speak? My name is, <coughs> Mar excuse me, my name is Marion Guthrie and I live at 8 Delano Park. I will not be repetitious, but I, I uh, have read the entire package um, and many people in town should be commended for the hours of work that they have put into this package. So I hope that the planning board will recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak? <clears throat> the public hearing is now closed. Okay. Um, before I lose one thought, on there was a suggestion by Carol Fritz that the multi-purpose playing field. Um, it's on page 2B. Um, again, for consistency reasons, if we're going to say multi-purpose playing field as approved, I think we need to say approved by the town council. Um, and I don't think we can delete that because it has not been approved as of yet um, by the planning board. We will be coming in for site plan review. I guess I'd like to respond to that by saying that I think we've got the definition of multipurpose playing field already once, and I don't think we need to spell it out again. Uh, that's the only thing I would uh, suggest with all due respect to the presenter. I, it's a defined term. It, it is a defined term. And I, I think it's a wonderful idea to take these 19-1-3 definitions and move them down to 19-6-8 um, B. So. Okay. So then, there's no further verbiage needed under under page 2 B, um, subsection B. Okay. I, I don't think so, Mr. Chair. Fine. If you want me to, I think I can um, indicate 
briefly what the changes are in, in this language, or how would you like to proceed? I don't know whether we want to do it in two steps or one. Um, the way I feel about it, the um, memorandum we got from Maureen, I've read a couple of times. It's a very easy thing to read. I have no problems with any part of that until I read the town attorney's <laughs> thing. Now I realize that there are probably some fine tuning that could be done. I, for one, would like to take both documents and forward them to the town council. Um, but that's just my opinion. I'd like to make a couple of changes in Maureen's draft, uh, just in terms of very fine tune-ups and capitalizations and that sort of thing. So I don't know how anybody else would like to proceed. Anyone else have uh, an opinion? I'll yield to Ms. McKay. Ms. Carlson or Mr. Wilcox, any opinion? Um, Uh, my impression of the comments from the town attorney seem that they're fairly succinct and could be interpreted by the town council just as easily as us. Uh, so I'm not sure it's really considering the fact that there will probably be that there may be other comments coming in for town council to consider from other review groups that I'm not really, uh, I'm not really sure that uh, it would be all that productive to try to incorporate them at this point in time. Yeah, how does everyone else feel? Mr. Chair, I feel that the two documents could go to town council. Um, we could debate, debate this and discuss this quite a bit. And I think they're going to have, as it was said earlier, there's going to be a lot of information coming in from other places. And I think they've got pretty much what they're going to end up with, I hope. So. Uh, that's what my, my feeling is. Perhaps I could just make the few suggestions that uh, are not in the town attorney's letter and see if we could uh, adopt those. Okay. The first would be on informal and passive recreation to strike and passive, uh, which is what Carol Fritz suggested. And then the definition would start informal activities and continue on with the um, town attorney's language. And on the fourth part of the definitions, southerly section, I think section should be capitalized in the heading. And question for Maureen in the last line of that paragraph, shown on the southern section of Fort Williams Park map, I take it that is a delineated section that everybody knows what it is? Yeah, it, it was included in a previous package the board had, and I, I just didn't include it in this one because it's the same one, but it's it's the... I remember looking at it, but I didn't know, one. but but we call it the southerly section, and then we call it the southern section, and I don't know if those are two separate things or the same thing. Um, we're talking about the southerly section of the park, and then we're talking about the southern section of the map. It should be one term, I believe... We're calling, I think it's most often referred to as the southerly section of Fort Williams Park. So we probably should take those places where we talk to the southern section and change southern to southerly for consistency. Okay. I think it's just the last line, or the one that I picked up anyway, is just the last line of the, southern, of the definitional section, southerly section of Fort Williams Park. And it's also on the next page in the, in the, mm -hmm. the first paragraph there. Well, southern but all of that is to be struck by the, um, according to the town attorney's recommendations. According to the town attorney's recommendations, A would stay, and then this would all be struck, the underlined going over to the top of page two, and B would be inserted, which would be these four definitions. Is that what the board wants to do, though? I think that's what we're saying by adopting the town attorney's recommendations. Makes sense to me because you will have it right there anyway in section B. There's no need to repeat it. Um, then in two, uh, now B2A, which will be C2A, uh, strike and passive so that it'll be just informal rec 
recreational activities. In fact, probably just say informal recreation. And okay down to D at the bottom of the page. I think offices, parking, and staging should all be initial caps to conform to the other um, capitalization. And that's really the end of it, except for the last page we should be referring to the southerly section of the map. And if those changes are acceptable, I'd still love to see Maureen just make the other changes and do it all in one uh, document. But uh, that must be my drafts person coming out. Any other <coughs> comments or changes or suggestions? We have a motion from the board. Um, just before you make that motion, can I just go over once more what everyone has agreed they want me to change? Is that all right? Fine. So <clears throat> assuming that at the top of page one where it says amendments, 1913 is going to be changed to 1968B. And moved down to. Right. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. Informal and pa passive recreation will now read informal recreation. Um, the fourth definition, southerly section, the S and section will be capitalized. The last line in that paragraph, that definition, will say shown on the southerly section, section capitalized, the Fort Williams Park map. Uh, Can I stop you, Maureen? I think informal recreation that the R ought to be capitalized for recreation so that we know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that third line up from the bottom of that definition that informal and passive recreation strike the and passive there as well. Then at the bottom of page one where it starts up that last paragraph, the southerly section, that whole par paragraph will be struck. And also the top, the remainder part of that paragraph at the top of page two will also be struck, and that will be where the four definitions will be inserted. Um, down under B, permitted uses, 2A, it will read informal recreation with a capital on the recreation instead of informal and passive recreational activities. Um, under C, we'll say southerly section, mm -hmm. that's capitalized section of Fort Williams Park map. And on page three, where it says recommend adoption of the southerly section of Fort Williams Park map. And then down at the bottom of page two, D, one little two little and three little I, offices, parking, and staging are all initial caps. Okay. And there's no changes proposed to the uh, addendum to the master plan of Fort Williams Park. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Maureen, at the bottom of page four, beginning of the last paragraph, mm -hmm. informal and passive recreation comes up again. You may wish to make changes there. To make that informal recreation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, everywhere in the draft where it says informal and passive recreation, I'll just substitute informal recreation. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I just have a question. Uh, will the town attorney's letter still accompany what we recommend 
just so they know <coughs> what his opinions were, or is that not going to go on? I, I believe they would be in receipt of this anyway, wouldn't they? Um, I would strongly urge that we, what's going to happen <coughs> is if you don't send it, I'm going to be requested to submit it. That's correct. So one way or the other. Well, that was, my, that was my suggestion. Thank you. Mr. Chair. I, I have a question, and Maureen might be able to help us with this, but have there been any uh, undertakings or intentions at this point in time to deal with other areas of Fort Williams Park in the zoning ordinance as opposed to just in the master plan for the park? Because this now becomes a sort of a unique beast. Yeah. The, the current zoning ordinance has a special district that's the Fort Williams Park District and I mean generally the uses allowed in there and it, to, it's oversimplifying it but the uses are basically what's allowed by the Town Council um, the proposed Fort Williams Park District is is pretty much the same thing this is um, an effort to take a certain section of the park and be more specific with with what the uses are so there has not been any other portion of the park that has gotten the focus that this represents. In terms of uh, protection of permanently dedicated open space, the master plan references numerous locations within the park. Uh, for instance, Officers Row, the Goddard Mansion, uh, the shoreline to the north of Portland Headlight, in addition, not just the shoreline to the south of Portland Headlight, uh, other areas that seem to be of critical importance for the future of the park. Uh, do, uh, in terms of procedure, in terms of allowing new uses in the park, uh, does this uh, establishment of this special zone within the zone, if you will, uh, make it does that raise this in importance above those other areas because this is now in the zoning ordinance? Um, it, has, it has more specific uh, definition of exactly what's proposed, what's, what, what's allowed there. So you could interpret it as it being more strictly protected, um, but the, the proposed zoning ordinance more clearly ties uses in the park to the master plan so that um, with, with the new ordinance, if it's adopted, um, there are not supposed to be uses allowed in the park that are inconsistent with the master plan unless the council changes the master plan. So that if the master plan currently shows those areas being open space, in, in theory, they should have a, a level of protection as well. But no, it will not be as specifically regulated as the southerly section of Fort Williams Park. Thank you. Ms. Okay. Mr. Chair, could I ask the planner uh, just honestly what would be the most useful way to get this to the town council? I have no objection whatsoever to getting the, you know, to giving them a copy of the uh, town attorney's letter. That just makes an inordinate amount of sense to me. But since you're working on it already, it just makes it also a lot of sense to me to, to do it in incorporating those comments so they've got one thing they can react to. The town council forwarded this to the planning board. I think it was right around September 10th. And they said you had until October 16th, which is tomorrow. So the changes that you've proposed right now are certainly within the scope of my ability to revise tomorrow morning and get to the council before the meeting tomorrow night. Um, I, I mean, it, it would be a good thing if I think it's good for the council to send along the town attorney's letter. But quite honestly, even if you don't, I'm sure someone will call me and request it. So that will end up going to the council as well. And so <coughs> I mean, it's six to one half dozen the other. I don't see any problem with, with proposing the changes you've already asked for and sending the letter. Uh, I think it just gets them a little further along. But what I'm suggesting is also incorporating the, the changes in the town attorney's letter into the revised draft that you do so that they've got a smooth thing to look at. They're still going to have to incorporate, in theory, the comments of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. Right plus any comments that the council has. And it will all probably go into an ordinance committee workshop session. So what, what one more set of comments really isn't going to make that much difference. Okay. On the recommended ad addendum to the master plan, I hope that you will pick up the same kinds of changes that we've suggested in the um, 
amendments to the proposed zoning ordinance, namely the southerly section capitalized. How to spell picnicking. Yeah, a few things like that. Um, <coughs> whatever it is that's, um, I think those are the two things, that and, and these informal and passive peers in several places. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Can I hear a motion, please? Mr. Chair. Be it ordered that based on the materials submitted and the facts presented, the Planning Board recommends the Fort Williams District Zoning Amendments and addendum to the Fort Williams Master Plan to the Town Council for, um, as amended per our discussion tonight, for adoption. You also want to include that we're recommending that the <coughs> town attorney's letter goes along with it. Mm -hmm. Including the, the comments um, made at the podium and the comments um, put forth in the town attorney's letter of October the 15th, 1996. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. And good night. Adjourn.